Hello everybody, it's Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Uh, not going to be long, but I definitely need to get something off my chest. Um, hope that uh, your weekend is off to a great start. As you can see, you're in the H. Uh, it's raining, uh, nothing new. The way things go here, it'll probably be sunny sometime during the day later. Uh, anyway, um, anybody who has followed me for any stretch of time knows that what I do is a new. I didn't just pop up on the scene a year or two ago. Uh, I've been doing this literally my entire adult life uh, for more than 30 years. Uh, the track record is there. I put in the work. I am committed. Something really full of Junior said um, years ago. He said that until you understand white supremacy racism, how it works, how it impacts you, uh, everything you think you understand will only confuse you. And he was so right with that. And I would add, there is an additional element and component to this that I think uh, we definitely are ignorant of, and that is even in the uh, the accumulation of knowledge concerning white supremacy and racism doesn't necessarily constitute understanding. And without action that is in alignment with the knowledge we do attain, there's no power gained. Knowledge in and of itself is not power. The effective and proper application of knowledge is power. We have a lot of people who know a lot but that's all they want to do is show people what they know uh, there's a lot of intellectual debates there's a lot of you know look what I know and not a lot of problem solving one of the things that I committed myself to doing when I determined that I wasn't just going to be a black man who loves black people. I was going to be a black man who came up with solutions that ease the, 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 the strain that has been consistent in this country for black people. And so for every problem that I identify, I made up in my mind that I would create a solution. So I spent a lot of time doing studies over 80,000 hours of literally academic scientific research into the behavior into the into the state of the uh the black the current black existence based on everything from 1619 forward and in every discovery i identified a solution there's never a problem without a solution the thing is we've been trained to focus on the problem and we've been we've been trained to point blame. Now, blame is this beautiful thing. Blame is this thing that relieves you of accountability. Somebody hurt me, and they very well may have. But what are you going to do about it? Because there's so many questions that you need to ask yourself about the situation. And one of the things you have to ask yourself about the situation is, how did they get close enough to hurt me? Where was I at when they hurt me? What was I thinking? What was I doing? And then, if you look at it on a uh, level where we're talking about white supremacy racism, specifically in the U.S., aimed at descendants of slaves, then you have to sit up and say, how did I get here? Well... They didn't subjugate you with the change. They subjugated you by robbing you of your values, your interests, your principles. Uh, they subjugated you with uh, a robbing by robbing you of your identity, sense of self, and then they re-implemented a new identity of subservience and inferiority, uh, of super dependence, and a feeling of desiring to be a part of something you weren't invited to. We have spent so much energy and effort trying to be accepted that we've lost the force we've had as a collective. We can't keep playing the victim and take on a position of power. The, the, a position of power can never, whether you're talking an individual, whether you're talking a family, whether you're talking a business, it doesn't matter. 
the position of power can never be assumed from the place or the, the, the position of victimhood. You have to remove yourself from this position of victimhood and take on a position of survivor. It's a difference. If you ever listen to Jews talking about the Holocaust, they call themselves survivors, never call themselves victims. Why? The survivor, there's a story in being a survivor. There's a, 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 a level of strength in being a survivor. There is a level of hope in being a survivor. There's some honor in being a survivor. Now, the goal isn't to remain a survivor. The goal is to sit up as from, a, from a survivor. I'm going to take the strength and the fortitude and the resilience that I've used to survive, and I'm going to transform that into power, into hope. I'm going to use it to build something different. And when I look at where we're at and how we are so easy to complain, to push off, to demand of a system that oppresses us, that they stop oppressing us, that that system that has its foot on our neck should somehow feel a sense of moral obligation to lift that foot. And, 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 and the idea that you can convince a morally bereft culture, nation, race, whatever you want to say, to all of a sudden respond to a moral command is absolute absurd, absolutely absurd. But we consistently try to do it. We'll, we spend more time trying to show them what they do to us than we do trying to stop it. And they know. Even the ones that don't agree with it know. The thing is, the alternative of standing for what was right, for what is right, would mean giving up the privilege that comes with that nasty little truth. And very few are willing to give that up. They might, they look at it and they'll say it's wrong and they, they'll say, oh my God, but they will never take a stand with you on any grand number. There are some that have spoken, there are some uh, uh, that have been extremely powerful forces. Uh, Dr. Jane, what's her name? She's been doing it since the 50s. And she's done it and she slapped him in the face with it constantly. And you won't get a whole lot of her in their history because she's put their history in front of them. But as a, as a, as a society, you're not going to get it. Uh, you know, you, you're simply not going to get it because while they may see the moral failure in it, they also see the, 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 the wealth, the privilege, the opportunity that simply exists because of it. And they can sit up and say, you know, I, I don't agree with it. I think it's horrible. But if you're not actively doing something to change it, you're a part of it and you are promoting it, whether you believe it or not. Same thing with us. Sitting up whining about it doesn't change it. You know, let, let, let's talk about some of the things. Until you create economic power, you have no power. All this stuff about voting and all that stuff means absolutely nothing if you don't have economic power. We prove that over and over again. We have turned out in increasing numbers every presidential cycle and we have produced nothing for our uh, uh, for our uh, race and that's regardless of who we put in office and actually we fared worse in measurable numbers we fared worse when we put Democrats in office but they are the saviors of black people because we don't understand how things work we fall for the old dope so many times but let's look at some of the things that we need to be focused on I told you years ago that miseducation was an instrument and a tool and a weapon the disproportionality of special education referral for young black boys is a weapon. It's a social weapon. The miseducation, and, and, and what are we doing? I told you that we need to be preparing and educating our children. Why? Because education begins at the point of settling and setting their identity, not at, not at the beginning of the attainment of academic skills. Academic skills is only one part of a much larger equation of education. Education isn't simply the attainment of academic skills. It is the preparation and empowerment of our youth to go out into a world that's inherently hostile to them as adults and not only compete, but win. That means they need to know who they are. That need, means they need to be prepared with a plan. They need to understand their roles. They need to understand what they're up against. They need to understand not to file for the Okadok. They need to have a plan for wealth. They need to have a plan for business. They need to have a plan for their family. They need to know how to project their wealth. None of this stuff is being taught. 
We're expecting the school to teach them. Malcolm told you 60 years ago that only a fool expects their enemy to educate their children to compete with theirs. Yet we do it daily. There's a problem with that. And there's always, well, what are we supposed to do? We can't, we can't. I've never heard can't more than I hear when black people talk about what's going on. Is it hard? Yes. Is it impossible? Absolutely not. So if it's not impossible, we have to strive for it. We owe it to the subsequent generation to present them with something more than what we, we inherited. And we're not doing that. We also need to look at the fact that black women are most likely to suffer from depression out of all the groups. Women are more likely to suffer from depression than men, but black women are the most depressed group. This is statistically speaking. And although they are the most likely to be diagnosed with depression, they are the least likely to get help. Now, that's an exception to that, and that's the black man. The black man isn't going to get help. He's not even going to tell you he's depressed. So we don't have the numbers accurately depicted among black males with depression because black men don't talk about it. We don't. Uh, the stigma of being depressed is so grand that we don't want to be associated with it. We don't want to be associated with anything associated with mental health, mental illness. Uh, and for that, we suffer. We break. We crack. And for that, Suicide among black males between the ages of twenty of uh, fourteen and twenty four has increased by forty nine uh, percent over the last six years. Forty nine percent. Also, if you think it's just black men and women, no, our children's uh, teenagers are killing us. Like I said, fourteen year old males. But here's the worst thing about it: our baby girls, ages five to thirteen, are in the. the uh, number one statistical category in suicides. And this has come with the rise of social media, specifically when you talk about Instagram. There's a study, a couple of studies done. Facebook, who owns Instagram, has this that shows that young girls, teenagers and younger, are at a greater risk uh, emotionally, psychologically, and physically because there are predators on these sites. But because of the impact of the reach, you got to understand, we grew up in a time where there's always been bullies. And unless you were a bully, you got bullied. And even bullies got bullied. Not that person that stood up to the bully. Um, you learn how to avoid the bully. You get through school. You follows you home on Instagram, on TikTok, uh, on, on uh, Snapchat. And, and the bully recruits people you don't even know to help bully you. And again, because we have not developed a true sense of identity, we haven't properly socialized our babies. They are vulnerable to suggestions that they're ugly to suggestions that they're stupid, to the suggestions that they're dumb, to assaults on their economic state. And again, that's on us. I told you years ago when I presented to you Black Man Lead as a rite of passage initiative to young black males, that it was necessary. And I started out, when I, did, when I created Black Man Lead, it was because I started out solely to gain an understanding of the best way to approach reducing African-American adolescent and young adult male violence. I had already dispelled the black on black crime myth for what it was. Um, do we have fratricide in our community? Yes, at an alarming rate. And yes, it needs to stop. Yes, it's a part of the problem. Um, if there's no enemy on the inside, the enemy on the outside can do us no harm. I've told you that over and over again. But I dispelled that myth by showing that we never hear about white on white crime despite the fact that 84% of white homicides are committed by white people. Never hear it. Same thing with any racial enclave. Murder, most violent crimes period, uh, from assault up to murder, are committed from an emotional rage or an emotional eruption. That normally happens in proximity with people you know. People you know are the ones who upset you. Now you have this whole thing going on now with road rage but that's a small uh, percentage of the homicides that are committed in this country every year so then the vast majority of uh, homicides are committed by people who look like you because there's people who live with you, people who live around you um, 
And so we understand with great uh, clarity that, that that that's a myth. And it was in it, that term, black on black crimes, were created for a specific purpose. It was to give a certain average narrative and image to black males. Now, does it mean that we don't have an issue with black males harming each other and harming our women? Absolutely not. We definitely do, and we need to deal with that. And that's a part of the rite of passage as well. First and foremost. It's easy to harm someone that looks like you when you don't value you. And so you have to create a sense of self-worth, a, self -self a sense of identity, right? Then you, you create a natural responsibility and accountability associated with the identity. This is who you are. This is what's gonna be expected of you. This is the standard you hold to. The thing to aspire to as a young boy is to become a man. These are the standards of manhood. This is what men do. See, and what we tell them, a black man never brings harm to a black woman. A black man supports other black men. A black man works to own his own. A black man supports his family. A black man, and, and you teach these principles. And you teach it in a way that a black man loves himself so much that he sees the beauty in loving a black woman. He sees the, you, you, the, 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 the power in building a black family. He sees the force behind supporting a black community. But it has to start early. I told you that. I gave it to you. I presented it to you. Uh, it's, it, 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 it gets likes and shares, but nobody's talking about actually getting behind it and making it a national, a, a national uh, universal rite of passage. And it doesn't have to be my name. It doesn't have to be black men. It can be whatever, but we need a universal rite of passage. I took the time to create one. The standards, looking at what you have to have to create a, a, a functional, pro-social black male that can handle the responsibilities that are going to be shouldered on him being a black male. There is no other type of manhood that is so distinctly weighted than black manhood. We are a constant target. We're constantly uh, trying to overcome false narratives that are written about us. For years, we've been the deadbeat dad. Come to find out the, uh, over the last 10 years, multiple studies done, every study done, all the way down to studies done by the CDC says that the black man is the most present father, the most engaged fathers. On the principles measured, where you measure fatherhood, black man is at the top of all of them. But that's not the black man you see, why? Because the black man is targeted. We need to create distance between the black man and the black woman. So we're gonna show the black man, woman the worst of the black man and when she encounters a black man that doesn't treat her right, she's gonna superimpose his mistakes She's going to superimpose all of the narratives of what she's seeing the black man upon him. So he doesn't just get charged with what he's done, which if it's wrong, it's wrong. But he doesn't get, just get charged with it. He gets charged with everything that black man that she's seen done, done wrong. It's charged on it. And it's, it's this idea that that's what black men are like. And no, we're not. The average black man is out there busting his ass trying to take care of his family. The average black man is out there trying to do what he knows how to do to make sure he's putting food on the table, but he's facing a challenge. We had this discussion yesterday among black men that are about that life, that are doing things that are in every way considered successful, but loving on their women, uh, being committed, uh, uh, spending time with kids and everything else. And we had this discussion. We've been commodified at black men so much that there's this unrealistic expectation of what we're supposed to do. When I just told you what the median wealth was for the for, for, for blacks, the median income for black men is forty-four thousand. Matter of fact, the black the black race is the only place where the the female is almost equal with the male in income with in median income. Black men, 44,000. Black women, 42 and, and, and almost 43. So a little over a thousand difference. And then when you move into other, the upper echelons of earning, there are a lot of six-figure women. But every, every demand is on, can he pay all the bills? Yeah, if you want to live with a $40,000 budget, but we trying to show them we can live with them instead of building. And I'm all about the man handling the bills, but you gotta build that. 
So everybody's running around looking for this. You know that that six percent of black men. Six percent, the last I checked, of black men with with at, at, at a wage earning age make six figures or more. But yet, that's what everybody's looking for. Six percent. So, this idea that everybody's out there getting this loot. And, and paying bills that looks good on social media but I do the research I see it I see the reality of it and here's the other thing about it if you don't understand money that all that sounds good but I'm going to tell you if you're not in high six figures it's still tough that's the thing that nobody's looking at because everybody's trying to show through their spending that they got it and they're anchoring themselves in, in a mitt in a uh in the mark, in the mock of of, of, of of economic collapse and failure, point blank. We trying to buy symbols instead of creating the real thing. I've taught it. I've written on it. I can go on and on. But here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line. If we don't do something different, we're going to pay a very steep price. It is estimated that by 2038, the black race, and we're already at 2023, and that could close quickly with the rapid rise of the Latino community and the way that they're building wealth uh, and owning businesses and, and, and all this stuff. Um, but as no later than 2028, we are going to be in a situation where we become economically and politically irrelevant. What happens when that happens? When we have absolutely no value to them. You've seen how they treat us when we have, when they want something from us. What happens when they don't need anything from us anymore? Because we have no economic power. We have no economic influence. We have no way of contributing to what they want. And we have no way of defending ourselves. What do you think happens? That's the questions that we need to be asking that we're not asking. And we're going to pay a major price for that. Look, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. I had to drop in and just talk to you for a while. Get this off my chest because I see it too often. We love to click in and whine. When there's so many things that we can actually be building together. But we, we are just sitting around and everybody's competing. So nobody wants to work together. Everybody's competing with other people to prove what they can do. And it's, it's, it's showing. On that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get off of here. I'm going to uh, make one more stop. Then I got to get to the house and actually do the work. I went to the gym this morning had to run a couple of errands. But I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day. Peace.